Hello boys, hello girls, hello babes. Welcome back to a brand new season of the Janae Talks Caps podcast. As always, thank you all so much for tuning in today and for being with us uh, just for another season of Washington Capitals Hockey. I don't know about you, but I am very excited. I think it's going to be a great season all around. So hey, if you want to be here for all of it, click on that subscribe button and we can get you strapped in for 82 and hopefully more if you include the playoffs, Washington Capitals games this season. And today we are going to be doing a season preview for your Washington Capitals uh, from the forward group to the defense corps to the goaltenders and perhaps just as importantly uh, of the brand new coaching staff that the Caps have installed for this season as well, uh, headed up by new head coach Spencer Carberry. Uh, we will break down how we expect the Caps to play under Carberry, how his system differs from former head coach Peter Laviolette's. Uh, we'll break down expectations for some of the big names on the Caps, uh, veterans and rookies alike. And we will give a prediction for the Metropolitan Division uh, and for the Eastern Conference as a whole. So, uh, lots to get to today. I'm excited, you're excited, we're all excited to get this brand new season underway. So let's get right to it, babes. Uh, so, over the off-season, uh, the Caps... Of course, uh, parted ways with former head coach Peter Laviolette. We've all heard that by now uh, after the team missed the playoffs for the first time since 2014. Uh, that was uh, the second longest streak of making the playoffs amongst the entire league. Uh, so the, the entire Caps organization obviously uh, was extremely disappointed to see that streak come to an end, uh, injuries or not. Uh, so... Out goes Peter Laviolette, and out goes assistant coaches Kevin McCarthy and Blaine Forsyth as well. Um, Kevin McCarthy, of course, he had been Laviolette's uh, kind of like his right-hand man, I guess you could say, um, everywhere that he's been. And Blaine Forsyth, well, uh, what can we say? Let's just say that we were all ready to see him go elsewhere uh, after a few seasons in a row of him making absolutely zero adjustments to a power play that was getting easier to predict by this season. So uh, the Caps did, however, spare assistant coach Scott Allen uh, from the house cleaning of their coaching staff, and that was likely the right decision. Uh, as Scott Allen, you know, he ran a penalty kill for the Caps last season that was top 10 in the league for much of the season. Uh, and you will recall that when I did my own end of season wrap at the end of last season, uh, Scott Allen was actually the, the only coach who I wanted to, to be spared uh, on the Caps 2022-2023 staff. Uh, so for what it's worth, I think that keeping him was the right call, uh, as was canning everybody else, frankly. So um, who are the new guys in town? Uh, well, the Caps have hired themselves a hell of a staff here. Um, obviously, you know, like we mentioned, it, it is headlined uh, by new head coach Spencer Carberry, who will become the NHL's youngest head coach uh, and who was heavily sought after by several NHL teams before the Caps ultimately won out and hired him. Uh, Carberry, of course, he used to be the head coach of the Caps affiliates, both in the ECHL with the South Carolina Stingrays uh, and in the AHL with the Hershey Bears as well. So he is actually the winningest coach of all time in Stingrays team history. Um, for those of you who don't who don't follow the Stingrays much, um, he won the ECHL's Coach of the Year award with the Stingrays in 2014, uh, and he was the runner-up again um, another two times as well. So the Stingrays. They made the playoffs in all five seasons that Carberry was calling the shots behind their bench. Uh, they won the division title twice and they went on to the Eastern Conference final two times as well. Um, so regular season success, playoff success. Uh, Carberry Stingrays also recorded an ECHL record 23 game win streak. Um, and his team also improved their point total uh, season over season for all five seasons that he was there. So that's very impressive. Um, you really like to see that. You know, coaches in the NHL, um, in hockey in general, really professional hockey anyways, they tend to have kind of a short shelf life. Like guys tend to kind of start to tune them out after, you know, two, three seasons maybe at the most. Um, so to see a guy like Carberry uh, coaching professional players down in, down in the ECHL and they actually, like I said, they improved their point total season over season for all five seasons that he was there. 
that makes it pretty clear that he was not being tuned out at all by his players. They were still... Um, you know, receiving his message, if you will, loud and clear. Um, so uh, after that wildly successful time in the ECHL, Carberry would then uh, eventually go on to become the second youngest head coach in the AHL uh, when he was hired by the Hershey Bears. So Carberry's first season in charge in Hershey was a success. Um, they, you know, they became sex, uh, sex. They became uh, successful rather. Uh, get your minds out of the gutter, guys. Uh, they became successful. Um, you know, right away as soon as he got there. Um, the Bears, they went on a 17-game point streak, uh, and they returned to the playoffs after missing out in their final season under their previous head coach, Troy Mann. So does that sound familiar to anybody? The team, they miss out on the playoffs. They're not happy about it. They get rid of their coach. They bring in Spencer Carberry. Um, pretty similar situation to what we have going on in Washington right now. Um, so the Bears under Carberry, uh, you know, just like the Stingrays under Carberry, um, they improved their points percentage season over season for all three seasons that Carberry was there. So um, you love to see that, like I said. And in his final season in Hershey, Carberry led the Bears to the McGregor Kilpatrick Trophy as the AHL's best team. Uh, and he won the AHL's Coach of the Year Award as well. He was then promptly hired by the Toronto Maple Leafs as an assistant coach on Sheldon Keefe's staff, uh, tasked with turning the Leafs' mediocre, at the time, uh, power play around. So before Spencer Carberry arrived, this is actually really interesting because um, a lot of people look at the Leafs currently, right, the la- these last couple of seasons, and they see, you know, a really effective power play clicking at a really high rate of efficiency that was not always the case with that core that they have there um so uh, like i said a lot of people don't don't know this but before spencer carberry arrived the leafs power play operated at just 20 percent efficiency um so it was very very mediocre um after spencer carberry was hired it shot up to 27.3 percent effectiveness uh, which was good for first in the entire nhl in the 2021-2022 season Uh, and then again last season uh, with spencer carberry at the helm once again uh, it was second in the entire nhl uh, behind only the historically good power play that the edmonton oilers were icing so In addition to Carberry, uh, the Caps, they also made a few other hires to round out what's honestly, like I referred to, um, a pretty all-star coaching staff, honestly. Um, They scooped both Mitch Love and Kirk Muller from the Calgary Flames organization, uh, both of whom were highly sought after as well by several other NHL teams. Uh, Mitch Love, he is the reigning AHL Coach of the Year, and in fact, he has won the AHL's Coach of the Year award in each of the last two seasons. Um, So twice in a row, he's the coach of the year um, in the AHL. He led the Calgary Wranglers uh, to an AHL best 51-17-3-1 record in uh, 2022-2023. So he, uh, like Spencer Carberry, you know, he's a young and innovative coach um, at just 39 years old. Um, And then with Kirk Muller, the Caps hired a guy with a ton of experience, um, you know, a ton of respect around the National Hockey League. Uh, as the 57-year-old Muller was actually being talked about as the likely replacement for Toronto Maple Leafs head coach Sheldon Keefe, should the Leafs have chosen to fire Keefe after yet another early and rather unceremonious playoff exit. Um, But the Leafs, you know, uh, they have chosen, obviously, to give Sheldon Keefe another crack at it. Um, I'm not going to say anything about that. I don't agree with that. But uh, yeah, um, much to the delight of the Washington Capitals, obviously, as they scoop up Kirk Muller uh, for themselves. So uh, and then to round things out even more, uh, the Caps also this offseason added a brand new position to their staff, uh, bringing on skills coach Kenny McCudden. So this comes after during exit interviews last season. I don't know if you guys watched those, um, but during the exit interviews last season, Uh, veterans TJ Oshie, Tom Wilson, um, and more, you know, they, they lamented the fact, um, that Peter Laviolette, you know, maybe he thought a little bit too old fashioned, um, in some ways for today's NHL game, like, you know, kind of just running practices and things the same way that you would like back in the 1990s. So, um, 
you know, Oshi, Wilson, uh, and the rest of those guys, they issued kind of an open ask uh, to Capitals Management that they would like to see some more innovation, some more forward thinking, and specifically that they would like to see the team hire a skills coach to work with players uh, specifically on that type of stuff, like in addition to all of the regular practicing that you do. Um, So ask and you shall receive uh, as Brian McClellan and the rest of the Capitals management um, and, you know, ultimately owner Ted Leonsis, uh, because he's the one writing the checks for these types of things. um, They went out and found uh, one of the very best skills coaches in the business and they hired him. So um, I'm pretty excited to see the effect that that will have as well. Um, So how can we expect the Caps to look under this new coaching staff? How is it going to differ from Peter Laviolette? Uh, Well, if you watched uh, Spencer Carberry's introductory press conference uh, when the Caps first hired him back in May, or for that matter, if you watched any of his press conferences or media availability since then as well, um, it's all about speed, right? It's all about playing at a fast pace. It's all about doing everything at a fast pace and doing everything as a five-man unit. Um, So when Carberry was first asked to describe in just a couple of words the style of hockey that he will want his team to play, um, he immediately offered the words pace and connectivity. Um, And he's been very consistent in that in all of his speaking since being hired back in May uh, all the way up until right now. Um, And so he offered some more insight as to exactly what he means when he says that he wants pace. You know, when he says that he wants his team to play fast. Um, So he says that it's not just about sheer foot speed and foot speed only. Um, It is about doing everything at a fast pace everything um, with and without the puck and in all three zones. So it's about moving the puck quickly from one area to the next. It's about making quick decisions. It's about reacting quickly. It's about moving quickly to cover one another without the puck as well. So he wants everything uh, to be done at a fast pace on offense and on defense. And he wants everyone, like I said, working together um, to play as a five-man unit. I also do think that it's going to be a big difference from Peter Laviolette's system in that Spencer Carberry recognizes that he's got a lot of very talented puck carriers on this team and he wants them to carry the puck. He wants them to have the freedom to do what they do best. So he wants his team to possess the puck all the time and not give it up. And if they do give it up, then he wants them to get it back as quickly as possible to go back on the attack again. So um, that's a pretty sharp 180 from what we saw with Peter Laviolette, uh, who, you know, he likes his teams to dump and chase, right? Like hang back uh, and clog up the neutral zone, slow the game down. Um, You know, Laviolette was very set in his ways and his way of thinking. Um, And his way of thinking is kind of like, you know, like if you're going in for a four check, and if there's even a 2% chance that you're not going to get to that puck and that the other team's going to be coming back at you, then... 2% is too much. Like, don't even go for that puck. That's kind of his thinking. Um, You know, he's just like, he wants you to, if there's even, like I said, that 2% chance that you're not going to get that puck, then he wants you to just like abandon the forecheck, abandon pressuring the opposition in their zone, um, and instead get back to the neutral zone to hang out and wait, you know, wait for them to come to you. So Peter Laviolette's system is all about shot suppression. And if you happen to somehow score a goal of your own, it's almost by accident, right? Um, and I've got to be honest, folks, like I hate that style of hockey. Um, it's not only boring, but it really doesn't work at all anymore in today's NHL. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my problem with it. Like it worked really well in the 90s and in the early 2000s, but it doesn't work now. Um, there's ample evidence that it doesn't work now. And yet, like some of these older coaches still like to deploy that type of, that, uh, that type of play, um, that style of play, right? Like it's, like I said, it's boring for the fans, Um, And, you know, quite frankly, it's got to be frustrating for the players as well, as it essentially takes all of the fun out of the game. um, And more times than not, like I said, that style doesn't even win you the game anyway. So it's like, what's the point of taking the fun out if you're not even going to win the game? Like, I will, I'll have no fun if I'm going to win. Sure. Like, that's fine. Um, But I'm not going to give up the fun if I'm not even going to win either though, like that doesn't make any sense. Right. So, um, and listen, like I am all about 
old school hockey when it comes to hits, um, when it comes to dropping the gloves when it's warranted, like all of that stuff. Like you guys know that, you know me. Um, I love that stuff. Uh, I love a good, clean, hard hit as much as anyone. Um, and in fact, like I think if the NHL is going to move away from, from hitting in the league, um, you know, that's going to be a big mistake for them. So don't get me wrong. Like I might be born in the nineties, but <laughs> there are aspects, um, of the so-called like old style game of hockey, um, that I absolutely love. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to some of that stuff in a lot of ways. Like, um, I like that old style in a lot of ways. It's just that one of those ways is not, um, when we're talking about the neutral zone trap or about slowing the game down in general, um, you know, slowing it down until it looks like guys are slugging through a pool of mud out there. Um, I don't like that. And that's what Peter Laviolette hockey is. Um, and it was pretty frustrating to watch last season if I'm, if I'm being honest, because uh, like I said, like take the fun out of the game. Fine. Um, it's not ideal, but I'm fine with it if you're going to win, but if you're not going to win anyway, at least make it fun. Like you got to have one or the other, right? Um, preferably both, but you've, you've got to at least have one or the other. Um, and like one of the big problems with that Peter Laviolette style of hockey for the Caps specifically is that it just does not utilize their best assets of their team at all, um, which is their talent and skill with the puck. Like when you've got Alex Ovechkin, Evgeny Kuznetsov, Nicholas Backstrom, TJ Oshie, John Carlson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. When you've got these high-end skilled guys on your roster and you're making them play dump and chase, like you can't tell me there's not a bit of a disconnect there between coaching staff and players. Like that is not utilizing and putting to good use the assets that you have on your team over everybody else at all. Like Laviolette essentially took... Um, you know, what should have been an advantage for this team, frankly, um, what always has been an advantage for this team. And he essentially neutered it and made it so that it didn't matter anymore, made it so that it was irrelevant because they weren't using it like he wasn't utilizing it. Um, so, you know, he made it so that they could get beat by teams that are way less skilled than they are because they're not using their skill anyway. So um, it goes without saying, but that's not a great way to win hockey games, frankly. Um, and I think that we saw that throughout Laviolette's tenure here. So to answer um, questions, you know, that I've received from fans, um, and thank you guys for sending those in, by the way, but to answer those questions that I've received from fans um, about the difference in Spencer Carberry's system, um, you know, versus Peter Laviolette's, the big differences would be, number one, the pace of play, um, and number two, that Spencer Carberry wants his team to possess the puck, uh, while Peter Laviolette wants his teams to, to, to play dump and chase, like I said. So dumping and chasing is really just another phrase for giving up possession of the puck voluntarily, right? Um, so really, these two head coaches' systems really could not be more different. Um, and frankly, you know, that's probably, that's probably music to a lot of Caps fans' ears. Um, so... Uh, now that we have talked uh, coaching um, and systems and all of that as well, uh, what do we think that the lineup is going to look like for the Washington Capitals uh, this season? Um, interesting to look at it. So with training camp and the preseason wrapping up, um, we have got a pretty good idea uh, of what it's going to look like. Um, and it does appear uh, that a number of rookies and young players from Hershey's Calder Cup champion team uh, have indeed made the NHL club. So that is obviously very exciting. Um, Caps fans have been clamoring for that. Several of them um, had, you know, phenomenal training camps with the Caps after obviously having been phenomenal for the Hershey Bears last season as well. So um, let's run through all of it here. Uh, so first up... Uh, the forward group. And now let's just put a disclaimer here that the line combinations um, obviously are subject to change at any point. Um, but so far, you know, at least in their most recent practice, um, the Caps have been running lines of uh, Alex Ovechkin reunited with longtime line mate Nicholas Backstrom, uh, who obviously hadn't been available a lot um, in recent seasons, and then with right winger TJ Oshie skating alongside of them as well. Uh, this line was very, very, very good 
in the preseason. Um, and obviously, you know, they've shown a lot of chemistry together in seasons past as well. Um, the second line uh, for a lot of the preseason has been Connor McMichael on the left wing uh, with Evgeny Kuznetsov at center and Tom Wilson on the right wing. Uh, so obviously a very fast line um, and it gives youngster Connor McMichael a real chance to make an impact as well, which I'm all for after watching him both in this NHL preseason. Um, and uh, throughout her, she's called her cup championship run as well, um, where he, you know, he was the Bears' leading playoff scorer. He was phenomenal. Um, and then for a lot of the preseason, the Caps have been running a third line of Sonny Milano on the left wing, uh, Dylan Strom at center, and uh, one of the AHL's leading scorers the last two seasons, and a top prospect whom the Caps stole uh, from the Calgary Flames organization, Matthew Phillips on the right wing. Get used to hearing that name. I'm telling you right now, Matthew Phillips. Um, oh boy, what a find Matthew Phillips has been uh, for the Washington Capitals. Um, and to be fair to the Flames, like it's not like they let this guy go. I mean, they they did in the way that like they didn't um, give him a real opportunity under Daryl Sutter. But um, what I'm trying to say is that it's not like they didn't want to re-sign this guy. It's not like they weren't trying very hard to re-sign this guy. They were. Um, but man, like I said, what a find uh, Matthew Phillips has been for the Caps. Uh, the Caps, very happy um, that Matthew Phillips chose to move on from the Calgary Flames organization um, and that he chose to come and play in the Caps organization, uh, because not only does he absolutely look like an NHL player out there, but he absolutely looks like an NHL scorer out there as well. Um, the kid has got talent. He's been showing it off all preseason against NHL players, um, and now he has made the club. Um, and he's fit in seamlessly on a line with, uh, with Strom and Milano, um, who, if you recall, I was begging begging uh, Peter Laviolette to put them on a line together last season uh, as they have insane chemistry. They're so good together. Um, and now Phillips has come out of nowhere, like I said, and stepped onto that right wing on that line. And it honestly looks as if the three of them have been playing on a line together since preschool. Like that line has been insanely good all throughout the preseason. Um, it's another super fast line and it's got a hell of a lot more scoring ability than, than most uh, NHL third lines. I will tell you that right now. So, um, you know, looking at it like that, that's the second line on most NHL teams. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, it's a first line on some NHL teams. Um, and by the way, like Carberry and the Caps, they were not afraid to wave an NHL regular to make room for Matthew Phillips either, which should tell you something. Like, they really wanted to keep this kid on the NHL squad. Uh, they think he's going to make a difference for them uh, that's, you know, bigger than the difference that some other more established NHL regulars would make. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you missed it, um, I should mention that as well in case some of you did miss it. Uh, the Caps waived uh, Nicholas Abe Kubel, who was a good NHL player, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, he's been good for the Caps, um, but they waive him to make room for Matthew Phillips. So, um, Abe Kubel, he did clear waivers, uh, so he is headed to Hershey and will be available to the Caps, uh, via call-up. Um, and then, uh, on the, uh, on the fourth line, uh, Carberry has deployed, um, you know, the best fourth line center in the entire goddamn league, Nick Dowd, um, between a couple of youngsters in Beck Malenstein on the left wing and Alexei Protus on the right wing. Um, now, uh, Malenstein and Protus are both very mature players for their age. Um, they're both responsible defensively, um, and holy hell, you know, like, is that ever a heavy crash and bang fourth line? Um, I think that line weighs about 800 pounds and stands as tall as the Empire State Building. Um, so I would not want to be facing off against those guys. I will tell you that much right now. Like, that's going to hurt. Um, and so, of course, um, that leaves us with the odd man out in all of this, uh, that being Anthony Mantha. Um, so Mantha, you know, he's been beaten out of his lineup spot fair and square, frankly, by a bunch of rookies, uh, who have outplayed him. Um, and like props, major props to Spencer Carberry, uh, and his staff for, you know, having the balls to sit this guy. Like he, 
is making the same six million bucks whether he's on the ice or in the press box, right? Um, at least if he's in the press box, he can't turn the puck over. <laughs> um, so like you have to think that he's either getting waived or traded at some point. Um, obviously a trade would be the capital's first choice as it would open up a ton of salary cap space for them to play with. Um, and for them to play with this season, his contract's up at the end of the season anyway, but, um, it would be nice to get that space before the trade deadline. Um, but you know, even like even waiving him, um, at least you would gain a little bit of salary cap relief and Hey, you never know. You never know. Like maybe some idiot claims him off waivers and takes his full cap it. Crazier things have happened, right? Um, and then on the back end, uh, lining up on the blue line, we have got the big man, John Carlson. He is back um, and he is paired up with last season's trade deadline acquisition, uh, Rasmus Sandin on the top pairing. Boy, did the Toronto Maple Leafs make a mistake there. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, not only did Sandin put up 15 points in 19 games after being traded to the Caps last season, but now that John Carlson is back, um, you know, after that horrendous injury last season, that top pairing has looked insane. Like, insane. I mean, they literally just have the puck all the time. They never don't have the puck. And that's a pretty good way to not get scored against, honestly, is to just always have the puck yourself, right? Um, so I saw the stats from the preseason the other day, including the advanced statistics for things like uh, puck possession. Um, and just let me run some of these by you guys uh, for this Sanding carlson pairing. So um, on the ice together uh, at five on five, uh, the Sanding carlson pairing had 21 shots for and only six against. Uh, 2.30 expected goals for, and only 0 0.45 against. Uh, that's an expected goals for percentage of 83.72, uh, which to put it mildly, if that continues, we are winning the Stanley Cup. Um, <laughs> like those are insane numbers. Um, goals for percentage, expected goals for percentage, like, if you're above 50, you're doing good. They're at 83.72% throughout the preseason. That is insane. Um, so, uh, you know, the stats for those two, they go on and on and on. Um, but I think you get the picture. Um, like, they're both very, very good. And together, they only get even better. So um, I'm very excited to watch that pairing work. Um, and then on the second pairing... Uh, we have got uh, Marty Ferrari and Nick Jensen. Um, obviously, you know, we know those guys very well, very reliable players, um, great players. And then with the injury uh, that occurred during training camp to Joel Edmondson, uh, he's out four to six weeks with a fractured hand. Um, although he has already started skating again. Um, but for now, anyway, that injury has opened up a slot uh, that would not have been there otherwise for another young player. Um, and it's come down uh, to three youngsters, uh, Alex Alexeyev, Hardy hamanok uh, and Lucas Johansson, uh, all three vying for that final spot in the Caps starting six defensemen uh, and to skate on the left side of that third pairing next to the ever-reliable uh, Trevor Van Riemsdyk. So um, to be honest, you know, like that's a really, really interesting situation that the Caps have there um, because all three of those young guys, like they have all played so well and looked so good in camp and in the preseason. They all look like they should be in the NHL this season. Um, Alexeyev, you know, first round pick by the Caps in 2018. Uh, he is a big punishing defender who I think everyone had penciled in to be in the Caps opening night lineup this season. Um, until, uh, that is until they traded for Joel Edmondson. Um, and then Haman Octel, uh, another huge behemoth of a defender, six foot four, 220 pounds. Um, he was one of the Swedish Elite League's best defensemen last season, uh, which caused more than 20 NHL teams, according to reports, to try to sign him this offseason, uh, including the Edmonton Oilers apparently sent Wayne Gretzky himself overseas to try and sign this guy. Uh, Hamanaktel ultimately turned down Gretzky and instead said yes to Ovechkin and the Caps. 
Uh, which is funny because that's not the only thing that Wayne Gretzky is going to lose to Alex Ovechkin in the Caps in the near future, uh, but that is beside the point for now. Um, Haman Octel, he has been unreal throughout the preseason, posting sparkling statistics against NHL competition. Um, and to be honest, much like Alex Alexeyev, Haman Octel, he honestly looks like he's a lot better than just a third pairing NHL defenseman. He looks like he should be higher in the lineup. Um, the problem, if you want to call it that, is that uh, the Caps have a lot of those guys right now. Like, look at their left side. Like, if you want Haman Octel or Alexev, like I said, to be playing higher in the lineup, who are you going to move down? Are you going to move Rasmus Sandin down? Are you going to move Marty Ferrari down? They're stacked on the left side. Um, and then you've got uh, Lucas Johansson as well, the Caps' first-round pick in 2016. Uh, and recent Calder Cup champion with Hershey as well, and he has looked unflappable out there as well. Um, So, uh, basically, the Caps have too many guys who look too good um, and not enough spots to have them all in the lineup on a nightly basis. Um, But like I said, it's a a pretty good problem to have, honestly. Um, We're not going to complain too much about that. Um, And then in net, uh, we know that we have got Stanley Cup champion Darcy Kemper and Charlie Lindgren is backing him up. Um, they both honestly performed admirably last season, honestly, uh, for how much the team in front of them was hanging them out to dry. Um, you know, I believe Kemper, um, I believe Kemper was, uh, he was still top 10 in the league in both save percentage and goals against average, which is honestly insanely impressive given the way that the team, like I said, was playing in front of him. Um, you know, if they provide him with even a little bit of defense this season, it's going to be a good year. Um, and if anything happens to either of those guys, you know, knock on wood. Um, but we do still have uh, the reigning Calder Cup champion and playoff MVP Hunter Shepard uh, chilling down in Hershey as well. So um, because by the, by the grace of the, ho- of the holy hockey gods, um, he somehow completely inexplicably was not picked up by anyone off of waivers when the Caps very reluctantly had to put him there. Like, my God, was I ever holding my breath for 24 hours for that one. Uh, But it worked out, and he remains in the Capitals organization. Um, So that is your lineup. It appears to be a good one. Um, And so to finish off this episode, like I said, I just wanted to run through a few rapid-fire predictions of mine for the season, um, including I will take a stab at the Metropolitan Division and Eastern Conference standings, um, or at the very least, what I think the playoff picture will look like in the East. Okay? Okay, let's go. Um, so, first up, my first prediction, uh, I think a 38-year-old Alex Ovechkin scores 50 goals or more this season once again. Uh, now, some of you, if you aren't Caps fans and you're listening to this, Maybe you don't watch Alex Ovechkin play hockey every night, so maybe you think I'm wildly unhinged right now. Um, But I am going to change your mind because here's my reasoning behind that prediction. First of all, uh, he was 37 years old last season, and he still scored 42 goals in only 73 games played. Uh, And you'll remember, of course, that he missed some time, um, you know, missed some games when his father unfortunately passed away. Um, So he did play in only 73 games, yet he still scored 42 goals, and that was with him playing on what was largely an AHL team um, for much of the season. So, like, you'll remember that Ovi's regular line mates missed most of the season um, due to injuries. So, like, whether it be Nicholas Backstrom, Tom Wilson, TJ Oshie missed quite a bit of time as well. Um, And that doesn't even touch on the guy who was arguably the biggest loss to the Capitals offense, and that's John Carlson. Um, So those are huge, huge pieces to be without, um, you know, both at even strength and on the power play. Um, And Ovechkin's power play numbers took a huge hit last season because of it. Um, Well, you know, because of those injuries and just simply because it was a Blaine Forsyth power play as well. Um, But both of those problems have been solved heading into this season. So... 
Um, the fact that Ovi managed to keep up the even strength scoring pace, even through a rash of injuries to his line mates last season, um, gives me immense confidence that this season we're going to see him go over 50 again uh, when you add back in, like I said, a revitalized power play. Uh, that has all of its regulars healthy, uh, and Spencer Carberry is drawing up the plays instead of Blaine Forsyth. Um, honestly, you know, the fact that Ovi at 37 years old was able to score 42 goals in only 73 games, and while getting next to no production coming from the power play, it's pretty crazy, honestly, because like basically all of his production uh, last season was coming at even strength. Um, which is obviously a very good sign moving forward. That's what you want, right? Um, and usually, like, when a player is getting older, um, you know, their scoring will be done almost exclusively on the power play, um, and they won't be able to generate anything at even strength. So that has not been the case at all for Ovi, uh, not even at 37 years old, even though, you know, normal human hockey players um, exit their prime somewhere around age 28 to 30. Um, But that's normal human hockey players, right? Ovi ain't human. We know this. Um, So if he does get 50 goals, by the way, um, he will uh, break that tie with Wayne Gretzky and Mike Bossy for the most 50 goal seasons of all time in NHL history. Most 50 goal seasons of all time in NHL history. No big deal or anything, right? Uh, Just another day at the office for Alex Ovechkin. So um, my next prediction, buckle up, Rangers fans, if there's any of you listening to this. Um, You might want to cover your ears. You might want to avert your eyes uh, because my prediction is uh, Connor McMichael of the Capitals is going to put up more points this season than former number one overall pick Alexi Lafreniere. And I will not explain myself. I won't. I just think that McMichael looks great and Lafreniere does not. Um, So that's that. That's my prediction. Um, These are only going to get even spicier the further that we move down this list, by the way. Um, So next prediction, um, the Washington Capitals and the Pittsburgh Penguins are not who the mainstream sports media would have you believe right now. And by that, I mean that the Caps are not going to be bad, like everyone is telling you they're going to be, and the Penguins are not going to be good, like everyone is telling you they're going to be. Um, In fact, my full-fledged prediction is that the Caps are going to finish higher in the standings than the Penguins. You heard it here first, baby. Um, no, really, like you really did hear it here first because all off season, I have had to listen to every major sports media outlet trashing the caps for being too old, too old. They say, while simultaneously praising the Pittsburgh Penguins. So I must be missing something though, because the Penguins are actually the number one oldest team in the NHL this season. ESPN must've missed the memo. Wouldn't be the first time. Um, but seriously, like the bias in the media towards the Pittsburgh Penguins is actually insane. Um, Like, take this whole Eric Carlson debacle, for example. Like, do you remember back in the summer of 2018, um, we had just won the Stanley Cup, and then during the offseason, there were all of these rumors that the Caps might trade for Eric Carlson. Uh, He was then a member of the Ottawa Senators. Um, But everybody, everybody in the media thought that that would be a stupid move for us back then because back then they already thought that Carlson was too old, too expensive and played too little defense. Um, So, you know, they were saying that it would be like colossally stupid uh, for us to commit that much money to a player who only played one side of the puck um, and who was about to turn 29 years old at the time. That was too old. Um, like I said, this was 2018. It's 2023 now. And so since then, naturally, Eric Carlson has only gotten older, uh, more expensive. And if it's possible, he plays even less defense now than he did back then. Um, and yet, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, they trade for Eric Carlson in this, the year 2023. Um, and the talking heads in the media are all gathered around the ESPN fireplace within a half an hour to commence the Kyle Dubas circle jerk. Like, so listen, like I'm going to give it to you guys straight. 
um, you know, since the wind up toys who sit behind the desks at ESPN won't give it to you straight. Um, this was a crazy, crazy asinine decision that the Penguins made this off season to trade for this guy. Um, and you know, to have him locked up to a contract at that amount of money for that amount of years, it's madness, man. It really is pure madness. Um, and I know what you're going to say, like, oh, but the guy had so many points last season. Why? Yes. Yes, he did. Let me ask you, did you watch many San Jose Sharks games last season? Even better question. How many three time Norris trophy winners do you know who have been traded twice? Listen, you guys, like no one asked him to play any defense all season. That's why he was able to have so many points last season. No one on that San Jose Sharks team played any defense at all. That's why they were a bottom feeder. And so Eric Carlson was basically allowed to be a fourth forward on the ice for them. Like he had no defensive responsibilities at all because the San Jose Sharks had no playoff aspirations at all, right? Um, And so because they were a truly awful team, you know, the management there, the coaching staff, they basically said like, okay, Eric, you know, let's throw our fans a bone here and let's just put up a bunch of points. And, you know, we don't care if you're a minus 50 in order to do it. And like, that's great. Hooray for San Jose, if that's what you want to do. Um, But for Pittsburgh, man, paying that guy $10 million against your salary cap for the next four years until he's 37 years old, It is absolutely ludicrous, man. It is certifiable. Um, And I get it. Like the the Penguins are in a a different spot than the Caps are, right? And that the the Pens don't have any good defensive prospects. Like they don't have any good young defensemen waiting for playing time. Um, You know, they don't have an Alexeyev or an Iorio or a Haman Oktel or a Lucas Johansson or even a Ryan Chesley or a Cam Allen in a few years. Like they don't have any of that. So, um I get it, but, and by the way, they don't have any of that largely because they traded away all of their first round picks, um, you know, for the better part of the last decade, uh, just trying to find someone who could handle Tom Wilson. So um, insert laughter here, Uh, but let's face it. Like if it were the Caps instead of the Penguins who had made this trade for this player who cost $10 million a season against the salary cap and he's not good defensively and he's 33 fucking years old already and signed for the next four seasons at that cap hit. Let's face it, man. If it were the Caps instead of the Penguins doing that, the Caps would be getting absolutely shredded right now in the media. That is a fact. Absolutely shredded. So for me, that's where it's just like, Come on, man. Like, it's just that it's just that overt bias, right, in the media. And, I mean, you don't have to look any further than the differing reactions that we saw to the Tom Wilson extension versus the reactions to this Eric Carlson trade for the Penguins. Like, I mean, Tom Wilson, 29 years old, um, extended for $6.5 million per season. The media's like, oh, fuck no, fuck no. He's way too old. I mean, the guy's practically the crypt keeper. His bones are about to turn to dust from being so fucking old. Yikes, no thank you. Horrendous signing, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then in the same breath, you've got Eric Carlson, 33 years old, $10 million per season. And they're like, you know, those same media members, they're like, ooh, baby, that's genius. Plan the parade. Um, so... Uh, There's obviously a disconnect between somebody's brain cells somewhere because something is not adding up. Uh, The math is not mathing. Um, And by the way, like which of those two guys would you rather have um, if you're in a playoff series? I'll wait. I'll let you think about that one for a minute. Um, But yeah, I mean, and and by the way, by the way, um, there's 32 teams in in, in the National Hockey League Um, who are absolutely throwing themselves in front of a moving bus to be able to sign Tom Wilson to that exact contract. Just by the way, just by the way, I'm just saying. Um, Anyways, all of this is to say that the Caps have gotten younger, the Penguins have gotten even older, and somehow uh, both of those facts are just completely ignored by the mainstream media, who had already clearly, um, you know, set a narrative for themselves, and they're just completely hell-bent uh, on following that narrative now, no matter what. Um, 
at the expense, of course, of actual facts, but uh, whatever. Um, So my prediction, like I said, is that the Caps will finish higher in the standings this season than the Penguins. Um, And I guess you can add to that as well that, um, you know, that that Eric Carlson contract is going to be an unmitigated disaster for them. I really think it is. Um, And you know what? I'm going to laugh. I'm going to laugh. Um, you can predict that I am going to laugh. Um, <laughs> you can take that one to the bank, actually, that prediction um, is that I am going to laugh in the face of the Penguins. So, um, okay, I think that that is a pretty good note to end on here, um, given that the Caps' first game of the season will be against those same rival Pittsburgh Penguins uh, at home uh, on Friday, October 13th. Um, Nothing scarier for Friday the 13th, frankly, than having to stare right down the barrel of Sidney Crosby's attempt at facial hair. Am I right? Yikes. Um, But oh, before we go, I guess I did promise you guys some predictions for the Metropolitan Division standings um, and the Eastern Conference playoff picture, right, as well. Um, So uh, let's rip through that really quickly and then we will get out of here. So no explanations, okay, because we are out of time here. So I'm just literally going to give you guys who I think is going to make it and not make it. Um, and then I, I truly can't wait for the comments section, (laughs) um, especially with no explanations being given. Um, okay. So, um, metropolitan division, um, first place, Carolina hurricanes, second place, New Jersey devils, third place, Washington capitals, baby third place, um, fourth place, New York Rangers, Fifth place, Eric Carlson and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, Sixth place, the New York Islanders. Seventh place, the Columbus Blue Jackets. And finally, bringing up the rear in eighth place, the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, Eastern Conference playoffs. Um, So obviously, uh, you know, the top three teams from the Metropolitan Division, who I just mentioned, um, I'll mention again, though, I have as the Carolina Hurricanes, the New Jersey Devils, and our very own Washington Capitals. Uh, They obviously all would be in um, by virtue of being in one of those top three spots in the Metropolitan Division. Um, And then the top three teams from the Atlantic Division, uh, I have as being the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, calm down. Uh, This isn't who I think is going to win in the actual playoffs. These are just regular season standings. Um, So yeah, with that being said, Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, followed by the Tampa Bay Lightning in second place and the Boston Bruins in third place. Um, And then for the two wildcard spots in the Eastern Conference, and this is where it gets crazy, um, I have uh, the Ottawa Senators and the Buffalo Sabres in no particular order, Uh, which means, that's right, I think the New York Rangers under Peter Laviolette are going to miss the playoffs. Maximum chaos, baby. Let's go. Okay, uh, on that note, I can say that I will talk with you all again next week. Uh, the Caps' first regular season game, like I mentioned, is Friday the 13th versus Sidney Crosby's facial hair. Uh, let's get excited, people, because you know what? Um, the Caps looked really, really, really good during the preseason. Um, yes, I know it's just preseason, but there are certainly things that you can take from it, um, You know, such as that Nicholas Backstrom and TJ Oshie Uh, You know, after their respective surgeries, they now both look like they're 20 years old out there again on the ice. So that is obviously huge. Um, You know, all of the kids look great. So that's obviously huge, including two guys who weren't even in the organization last season in Matthew Phillips and Hardy Haman Octel. So that's obviously huge. Um, So there are things that you can take from the preseason, you know, individual performance wise for sure. And just the team as a whole looks great. Like, and they seem excited as hell to play under Spencer Carberry, um, which is something that was missing last season was that excitement that we usually see with the Caps. Um, you know, they, they're a bunch of guys who they love hockey. They love to play hockey. You can always see that from them on the ice. And we didn't really see it last season. So um, I'm excited. And hey, you know, like it wasn't just our, our eyeball test. Uh, that says that the Caps look great in the preseason either. Um, Like the stats actually back that up as well. The Caps had the highest expected goals for percentage of any team in the league in the preseason. And it wasn't even particularly close. 
Uh, the Caps' expected goals for percentage for the preseason as a whole was 63.82%. Uh, that is an absolutely wild number, um, considering that, you know, like I said, you're doing well if you're anywhere above 50%. Um, so, like I said, you know, it wasn't just our eyeball test uh, telling us that the Caps under Spencer Carberry have had the puck all of the time. They actually have had the puck virtually all of the time. Um, so let's enjoy it, babes. Uh, things are looking good as it stands right now as we strap in here for another 82. Um, I have a feeling, like I said, that it is going to be a lot more fun than the last 82. And that's that's all we can ask for, really. Hockey's meant to be fun. Sports are meant to be fun. Um, and we will be having fun here on the Jenea Talks Caps podcast all season long. Uh, we will be right here with you for all of those games, all 82. And like I said, hopefully more if we, make, if, if, if we do make the playoffs. Um, so, hey, if you haven't done so already, uh, please do take a moment now uh, to click on that subscribe button. We would love to have you here along with us for this ride. Um, and as always, babes, thank you so much for listening. We will chat with you all next week. And as always, let's go Caps, baby.